six-week tour in America, and um, <laughs> and we're still meeting new faces and enjoying new wonderful, beautiful moments daily. And I'm so glad we've got more than time to share. If time would be our only context, then um, we would get nervous along with the disciples. Remember in John 14 when Jesus said to them, Let not your hearts be troubled. Because they were running out of time. <laughs> Hanging around Jesus for three years and suddenly they felt, well, <laughs> he's talking about leaving, about departing. And I'm so glad that Jesus addressed that. When he said to them, I have no intention to leave you as orphans. You see, it is coming in the flesh. The God of creation cancelled every possible definition of distance. His name, Emmanuel, means exactly that. Religion thrives on two lies. The illusion of distance and the illusion of delay. You see, religion needs paying and returning customers. <laughs> Jesus didn't come to add dimension to the prophetic word. He is the fullness of the prophetic word. Time in no definition can be more complete than what Jesus is. Paul calls him the fullness of time. What a moment to celebrate. How the disciples wished Jesus would say something like, it's to your advantage that I stay a little longer. <laughs> and then he goes and blows the whole theology away when he says, it's to your advantage that I go. <laughs> because I want to surprise you with, with more than just my presence in my physical body. I want to surprise you with the revelation of my presence in your body. <laughs> Can it get any better than that? <laughs> We don't have to waste time and money to travel to Jerusalem no more. Because you are the city. You are the temple. You are the moment. All creation was standing on tippy toe. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. My going as you in mind. Jesus never came with a three-year agenda. He didn't come to win a few desperate votes for a new cause called Christianity. He is the great unveiling. Every veil was torn in His coming. There is no distance, no delay. I mean, it cannot say it clear. Even in King James English, it reads, The hour has come. There is no greater hour to wait for but to celebrate the fullness of time. Fullness. Completeness. In Him, says Paul in Colossians 2 verse 9, in Him dwells all the fullness of God in bodily form. I'm so glad Jesus didn't arrive on planet Earth in angelic form. I mean, he could be a 20 feet tall angel 
if it means zero to us. His life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection would be totally irrelevant. But he vindicated your design. He revealed the image and the likeness of a now invisible God in human form. God can never again in all eternity be invisible. His name can never again mean anything but Emmanuel. It cannot be God without you. He embraced you. It is to your advantage that I go. Where are you going, Jesus? I'm about to die your death, he says. So that you may know that you co-died in the mind of God. I go to prepare a place for you so that you may be where I, not where I'm going, where I am. <laughs> he is not hiding in history. He is not hiding in outer space. He's not hiding in the distant future. Neither is he hiding in the pages of the book. He's reflected there as I am in you. God cannot get closer to the human race than what he did in the incarnation. God cannot be more in your face. The word is near unto you. As close to you as your breath. <laughs> Closer to you than your next thought. The word that was before time was finds language in your mouth, quickens your mind with revelation, with understanding. John celebrates this in 1 John 5, 20. He says, we know that the Son of God has come. What did He come to do? He has given us understanding to know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true. Truth is so much more than a clever definition a wonderful statement, a wonderful philosophy, the truth that frees us, that sets us free from every possible definition of deception, distortion. It's not a scripture verse. These verses all point in one direction. This whole book is all about him. And he is all about you. I go to prepare a place for you. He says, I've known you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I know you better than any parent could ever know their child. You are not introduced to God during your brief visit on planet Earth. You see, we are not inventing fellowship. We are invited into the fellowship of the Father and the Son. We don't have to invite the Spirit of God Anywhere, he invites us <laughs> into a fellowship that was before time was. And he's known you there. 
He has known you there because he had nothing less in mind for you but to be embraced. Paul says it so beautifully in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 12. He says, so that we may now know, even as we have always been known. You might have been a surprise to your parents, but you are known. No other revelation can give any context to the message of the cross. Why would God pay such a ridiculous price? I mean, why would a man who discovers a treasure that is hidden in an agricultural field, and he is now the only man who knows the true value of the field, he knows that this treasure gives value to this field beyond any historic value that any bumper crop could define this field to be. He knows there's a treasure hidden here. And what does he do? Matthew 13, 44 tells us he hides it again. And immediately, you know, Jesus suggests in this parable, this man has a plan. You see, when we are talking the plan of salvation, we are dealing with the greatest engineering that our minds could ever imagine. We flew about a couple of days ago from Washington. We flew over your beautiful city, San Francisco. We saw the Golden Gate. Today, <laughs> Rod and Eileen drove us across the Golden Gate. And I tried to fill you as much of this as possible and capture the moment. And then we parked at the viewpoint and we took our pictures and we did a little video clip and we were just so excited to witness. The courage of man to build a bridge. Yes. To engineer what seemed impossible. To imagine distance cancelled. The man who hit the treasure again has a plan. Yes. <laughs> Do you know how you measure distance? No. Not by time. Whether it's kilometers per hour or miles per hour. Or age or eternity. Neither do we measure distance geographically. In South Africa we are, can you believe it, nine hours ahead of America. You're not going to catch up. <laughs> but the man who discovered the treasure hit it again. And then he went away. And you know what he did? He redeemed the value of the field. In John 4, Jesus says, you say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Who labored for that harvest? You did. But you know that the bread that you eat cannot satisfy your hunger because you're not made to live by your own harvest. Jesus says you are looking at the wrong harvest. Don't let the economy or the value of the dollar or the, what did we get to that dead dinners? Don't let the value of human currency dictate the value of your life. Because they come and they go silver and gold and all the wealth of this world cannot redeem your mind. your individual value was redeemed once and for all you were bought at a price 
You know what it cost? Everything that God had. He went and he sold all that he had to redeem the original value of the field. So how do we measure distance then? <clears throat> In Acts chapter 17, Paul addresses a group of Greek philosophers. They were not new at it, they've been going at it for hundreds of years. Daily, they would try and express their latest idea in their quest to define deity. Only problem was, their idea of deity was wrong. Jesus had to tell the Jews, anything you know about God that is unlike me is not God. He says, you want to see the Father? Look at me. So Paul addresses these wonderful men in their pursuit to define God. And he notices all the altars and the shrines and the artistic expressions. He has even read their books because he quotes from Aratus who wrote 300 years before. He says, one of your own poets said, and then he quotes him. But before he quotes what Aratus wrote, he makes this marvelous statement. He says, the God of creation, who gives you your next breath, by the way, whether you're pagan, Gentile, philosopher, Jew, barbarian, South African, American, European, he gives you your next breath. Because he knew you before he formed you in your mother's womb. He's closer to you than what you think. <laughs> then Paul declares, he says, This God, who is the God of creation, is not far from us Christians. He's speaking to the Greek philosophers. He says, from each one of us. Emmanuel is not more Emmanuel to the Jew than what he is Emmanuel to the Gentile. He's not more Emmanuel in certain areas geographically than what he is in San Francisco. We get so spooky sometimes when we think, oh, there's a greater anointing there or a greater presence there. Let's get to the revelation of Emmanuel. And Emmanuel has an address. You are his address. He does not dwell in buildings, temples, sanctuaries, cathedrals made by human hands, built with gilt money. He dwells in his own property. You are redeemed at a price. You are not your own. His dreams for you exceeds your own. Exceedingly, listen to Paul's language. Yet he's speaking King James again. Exceedingly, abundantly. And if that's not enough, he says above. And if that's not enough, he says all that you can ask or imagine. Because remember Paul's language in Ephesians 3, it's about the love of God that su surprises, that surpasses our understanding. And he surprises our understanding. Amazing love. Amazing love. You see, you were not introduced to God through your successes or your failures. His love was not a reward for good behavior. He loved you all along. While you were dead in your trespasses. He loved you. Because he knew that the treasure was not the earthen vessel. It was something in the earthen vessel. The treasure was not trying to just resurrect my farmland to make it look better. And fence it in again. Get rid of the thorns and the thistles. There was a treasure hidden in the field. 
this mystery that was hidden for ages and generations is now revealed. It is Christ in the nations. You see, in the incarnation, God embraced humankind in one person. Glad tidings would produce no joy, never mind great joy, if the glad tidings did not include you. <laughs> the best news is irrelevant if it's not your team winning. <laughs> what makes some glad can make you sad until you realize how included you are in God's plan. Because He engineered a plan. We love traveling, we travel a lot in Africa especially. And often in our own country we will find little hints of the old roads, even patches of the old ox wagon tracks. And those roads, especially when it comes to mountainous areas, they would have many curves and many bends in them. And they'd go down steep and deep valleys and climb high mountains. And those roads are not designed for most modern cars. But then thank God, we also have what you call interstates, highways, where mountains are brought low and valleys are filled up and crooked places are made straight and rough places are made smooth. And Isaiah says in the next verse, this is Isaiah 40, he says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. God is not about to just sneak in on planet earth and rapture a few. <laughs> he has a message for mankind. And you are his message. You are his living epistle. I translate all my free time from the original text because I'm addicted to the book. But more so to the message of the book. But the most accurate translation would always be the incarnation. Nothing beats the living epistle. <laughs> you know what's so fun? Is you don't have to concentrate on digestion once you've eaten your food. It happens. Now if we are designed to be blessed with taste buds and wonderful feast and meal moments he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word in its most complete context. That's what the Hebrew word means, every word that proceeds from his mouth. The most authentic context of the word is not even the Greek or the Hebrew or the Aramaic text. It's the Ruach of God, the breath of God that ignites understanding. Did not our hearts burn within us while he opened to us the scriptures. We never saw Moses that way before. We never read the law like that. We never understood Isaiah and Jeremiah and those long yawning times through the prophets. We never heard the songs like that before. But you see, Jesus is the music of this book. <laughs> Did not the hearts burn within us? While he talked to us. And remember, Luke is now interviewing these two men on their way back from Jerusalem. They have witnessed the crucifixion. They have heard the rumors of his resurrection. But their minds were veiled. By what? By their own doctrines. They had hoped that at least Jesus would fulfill their political aspirations and start the Christian party. Get rid of the Sanhedrin and Caesar. 
At least Jesus. Failed. But suddenly they heard the book. And the book spoke a message that they knew. There was only one of. There is not another message in this book. So don't waste your time looking for another. This book has confused and divided more people than any other book on planet Earth. Because the letter kills. While it can be very entertaining, it's still deadly. I mean, you can go and written and listen to, to the uh, uh, prophetic utterances and, and, and professors studying all the relevant utterances prophetically. But Jesus says, if you study the book and you miss me, you miss the point. A friend told me the other day that he's now, he's bought 500 hours of DVDs on prophecy. What a waste of precious life when the hour has come. Are we buying into another 40 years in the wilderness? Oh, but God's good. He provides, He blesses. Surely He did provide and bless Israel. But they trapped His blessing in their unbelief. They ask for a no more mentality. When the nations are waiting for their testimony, they saw giants out there. Jesus saw a defeated foe. We've preached the devil back into business and written scores, volumes of libraries on demons and witchcraft. What an insult to the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb redeemed your innocence. You see, distance cannot be measured by time or by geography. It can only be measured by my ignorance of my oneness with Him. There is no larger distance than hostility. Guilt, inferiority, blame, shame. You can sleep in the same bed and feel a million miles apart. Jesus did not come to introduce a new set of compromised rules called grace. He came to reveal the power of grace. He is the magnet of the universe. The chief sinners in society were glued to him. Why? Because they recognized in him and they remembered their true authentic design. They knew that the life that I lived until yesterday was a lie. He did not come as a display window so that we can tick him off with all the other gurus and prophets. He came as the mirror, likeness of you, the fullness of deity in a human body. Colossians 2 9. What does the verse next verse say? And you are complete in him. <laughs> I'm so glad that Jesus didn't come with banners to try and win votes for the Christian cause. Join my group. Don't vote for Buddha. Don't vote for Moses or Muhammad. Vote for Jesus. He had a much louder voice than that. Image and likeness language. That addresses every man and woman's conscience. Word conscience, Latin word, con, together with science, to know. The Greek word is sum edo. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. Now this is just after he said a few verses before that we all with unveiled faces are beholding his what? 
His glory, which is the result of what? How can we see His glory? Because of what happened on the cross. When God cancelled every definition of distance, every possible excuse I could have to feel separated from God because there are too many deep valleys in my past and too many high hills and crooked places. You don't have to deal with ancestral curses anymore. Don't waste your time studying that. Because every possible curse was broken on the cross. And every possible blessing that God could ever have in mind for the human race was poured out through the blood of the Lamb on the cross. And the Spirit of the living God. Ephesians 1 verse 3, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You cannot be more blessed than what you already are. It even changes our, the Lord bless you my brother, kind of sentences. Because how can He bless you more? We are so embraced. We are so one with Him. I and the Father, we are one. <laughs> what kind of response did that draw? Stones. They were ready to kill Him before His time. Because that was blasphemy. If ever they had heard blasphemy from the lips of a man, that surely was. I'm so glad when he tells his disciples in chapter 14 not to be troubled. He gives them very good reason. <coughs> he says, trouble will never register again if you discover that I'm in my Father and so are you. I'm in my Father and I'm not closer to my Father than you are. You are in me. And to crown it all he says, and I'm in you. Let's not get distracted with now. In Christ. Christ in me. He's not far from each one of us. Just in the context of this gospel, there can never again be an us and them. Because there are no children of the devil. If he's the father of lies, there is only one true parent of the human race. Mankind began in God. We are the God kind by design. And this was what Jesus redeemed at the highest price. To sell all that you have means you've made a calculation. To declare that what I buy with all that I have becomes all that I have. God has no other interest in the universe. He's not secretly investing time and management on another planet. <laughs> if we have time to allow the Hubble telescope to go that way, the Hubble will confirm that this little planet called Earth carries God's total concern. says to the Greek philosophers and now he quotes Aratus having said God is not far from each one of us imagine how the hair on their back stood up <laughs> what do you mean I mean, we, we've spent all our lives pursuing him <laughs> and yes proof Paul says you've been looking in the wrong direction <laughs> I mean, if you dig a hole and there's no gold, you're digging the wrong hole in the wrong place. <coughs> Doesn't mean there's no gold in this planet. Oh, but I've searched the scriptures, you know, and I've found 50 more that contradict your message. But if those the scriptures do not confirm how free you are, you're wasting your time with the wrong scriptures. Do you know that there are certain scriptures that are no longer relevant? Remember Peter? The man sincerely praying on the rooftop. He doesn't want any interference. 
Then he wants to have a nice view over the village. To feel inspired in his prayer life. And then hunger pains interrupt his prayer life. He gets hungry, Acts chapter 10. What, what happens when a Jew gets hungry? Exactly what happens when an American gets hungry. <laughs> Favorite food pop-ups appear. They were so vivid that Peter placed his order. You can read it. Luke writes about it. Acts chapter 10. Because it says, while they were preparing his food. Why were they preparing his food? Because he placed an order. He said, mom in law Because his mother-in-law traveled with him. That favorite stew. And he could taste it. Because he could imagine it. But God had other plans. He fell into a trance while they were preparing his food. I love it when God interrupts your hunger to give you a new diet. And there appears a beautiful clean tablecloth. And to Peter's horror, he witnesses every unclean animal. Can you imagine that? I mean, we have a lot of unclean animals in Africa alone. Can you imagine every unclean animal? Reptile and bird. Not cut up into nice little blocks of stew with favorite spices. Alive in their dirty old bodies. I wouldn't say dirty, no. That would be besides the point. In their scales and their hair and their warts. We have wart hogs. In South Africa, they've got wolves. Peter lost his appetite like that. And you know what Peter did? He quoted scripture. This blade said, I can find a verse for that one. Then it says, Thou shalt eat nothing unclean. And God says to him, not once, three times, Peter, you may no longer call any, never mind the animals, any man, common, or unclean. What would God refer to here? What is God's reference then? I mean, they're obviously unclean. But what happened on the cross? When the Lamb of God this time, not the prophetic shadow type lamb of man that the shepherds were raising when they heard the angelic voice. Glad tidings of great joy which belongs to all people. <coughs> what did the lamb of God do with sin? He took it away. How far away? God says as far as the east is from the west. Now that's pretty far. Because there's no west pole or east pole. That's as far as it gets. If we're talking distance here. We're talking that God established innocence. Not as a futuristic hope. But as a now reality. Jesus would not be raised from the dead. If man was still guilty. Ephesians, sorry, Romans 4.25 says it very clearly. He says he was handed over because, and every theologian will agree on this part of the verse, Jesus did not die for his own sins. He died for whose sins then? For our sins. But then the next line of the same sentence says he was raised because of our innocence. If it didn't happen then, where is it going to happen? What gospel is there to preach? It's not my belief that makes something true. A diamond doesn't become a diamond when you discover it. Water does not suddenly become H2O when you drink it. It's been H2O all along before you discover the treasure it had its original value. The lost coin never lost its original value. Oh, the Greeks, the philosophers, the Pharisees were so offended when they saw how Jesus embraced the sinners. They said, Jesus, how dare you? You are ruining your reputation. He says, for this I came. And he tells them three powerful principles. In all three parables of Luke 15, Jesus just repeats himself. In the lost sheep. In the lost coin. In the lost son. 
The word lost has no other meaning but pointing to ownership. <clears throat> now, if David prophesied in Psalm 24, verse 1, he did more than just prophesy, he declared that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell in what? In it. The very first thing that Jesus redeemed when he sold all that he had, he bought his own back. From whom? You don't buy anything from a, from a thief. At what point does a thief become an owner? You know what we've done in our theology? We've handed over ownership to the thief. And a defeated thief. Wow. Jesus was not in some transaction, you know, arm wrestling the devil for a discount. <laughs> because look how wrecked humanity is. God desires yes. to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose. I'm so glad that we're dealing with a stubborn God. <laughs> a God who has his mind made up. Come on. If he's the engineer of tomorrow morning sunrise, he's equally the engineer of the salvation of the human race. He came to his own. And he didn't feel embarrassed for his own did not recognize him. When they resisted him, when they crucified him, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How did Paul introduce this gospel then to those Greek <coughs> philosophers? Because, I mean, Paul said the most amazing sentence. Really, I mean, there are most amazing sentences all over in this book when you begin to see the revelation of Christ. Paul quotes Aratus, and you think, could Aratus say that? Yes. What did he say? In him, yes. we live yes. and move yes. and have our being. Yes. Can, can it take any closer? <laughs> can there be a closer association to your life? <laughs> can anything define you more? But your maker, in whom you live, and move, and have your being. So it's all correct theologically when he said, he's not far from each one of us. He is equally close to each one of us. And then Paul makes it even worse, I almost said, but even better. When he says, this is all Acts chapter 17. He says, we are, remember, listen to his language, not us and them. We are his offspring. Man did not begin in his mother's womb. Man comes unto them. We've translated it again. But unto them means from above. Nicodemus, if you do not recognize that you began in me, in God, your reference would always be your mother's womb. But there's another birth. It's from above. And it is this birth that he came to proclaim the resurrection again. We are born anew, says Peter. 1 Peter 1 verse 3. We are born anew when he was raised from the dead. How was that possible? Because he died on death. In the mind of God, in God's economy, one died for all, therefore equals. All have died. God's not confused about that. God is thinking, maybe that's a little bit bold, you know. <laughs> Imagine God apologizing to Abraham. So every remember when I told about all the nations, I think, you know how many things, would you mind if we just compromise it a little bit? Maybe you should go for a, you know, Sarah's not going to do it, sorry Abraham. Out of that dead womb, Isaac was born. Out of that same dead rock tomb, we were born anew. 2 Corinthians 5.17 does not say, if any man be in Christ is a new creature. I'm not saying this, the Holy Spirit said this to me one day, it shocked me, out of my pulpit almost. In fact, I lost my pulpit a few days after that. 
I found a new one. <laughs> he said to me, and Francis, you're preaching to Corinthians 5.17, you're wrong. I said, wait a minute, it's one of my favorite verses in the book. In fact, I turned there and it was the only verse in 2 Corinthians 5 that I underlined. Never ever saw verse 16 before. Because Paul writes, he says, therefore, if any man be in Christ. You see, the therefore makes the if no longer a condition but a conclusion. Because the therefore points back to the previous verse, which says, From now on, therefore, I no longer know any man after the flesh. Not even me, son of Benjamin, and I felt so proud of my noble birth. Benjamin no longer defines me. My Jewish nationality no longer defines me. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There were two sons. But you know what the father said to the son? He didn't want to join the party immediately. I believe he will come. The festive sound is too attractive. <laughs> Met a young man in Austin two weeks ago. And if ever I could tattoo something on my arm, I'll tattoo that. He's got a Greek text tattooed on his arm. Luke 50. My son, you've been with me all this time. And all that I have is yours. But it's provoking them to jealousy. But it's the same sonship. We who are far off have been brought near. He broke down every wall of hostility, every definition of distance cancelled for all eternity. We are preaching Emmanuel. Can you hear an echo in your spirit? That echo is gospel to your neighbor. I was going to go to 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2, but we got distracted with verse 18 of the previous chapter. Now with unveiled faces. We all are beholding the glory of the Lord as in a mirror. Never again as in a display window. The days of window shopping are forever over. You never need to claim another promise. Gaze into the mirror. Because as you gaze into the mirror, something happens to your spirit. Your spirit awakens your mind to metanos. There is no word such as repentance, so you can scratch it out of your Bible. Right there, metanos. To discover God's eternal thought, together with His mind. Your thoughts, not my thoughts. Therefore, your ways, not my ways. But the rain and the snow came in the fullness of time. We've cancelled distance between heaven and earth. And instead of the thorn tree, the fir. Instead of the briar, the myrtle. A new creation was born when He was raised. How long do we want unbelief to trap us in a wilderness of ugly duckling mindsets? Hostile in our thinking. Because this doesn't quite line up with all my favorite scriptures. What a wonderful day for you to discover that. Because there's only one meaning to this book. And his name is Jesus. And his name spells your what did God say? His image, his likeness, the treasure in the earthen vessel. There's so much more than just the cosmetic hue. We're not talking earthen vessels here. Color, shape, sizes, ages. We're talking treasure language. I'm so glad that young Deacon Philip saw more in the table than just serving another meal. He outran a chariot on its way back to Africa. On a lonely road called Gaza. Do you know what the word Gaza means? Treasure. 
No wonder this man was the chief treasurer of Africa. He was about to discover a greater treasure. Not in Isaiah the prophet, but Christ in me. Christ in me. Can it get better? Can it get closer? You mean I don't have to travel this dangerous road next year to celebrate another Jewish prophetic picture? But I can have the substance now. His fullness in an earthen vessel. There's no other message. When the body was torn on the cross, the earthen vessel was broken. So that the true light that enlightens every man. I love Paul's language. He never gets distracted. He's on a shipwreck. And there are three groups in the same shipwreck, each with their own agenda. The sailors act as if they are going to just anchor this boat. Because they're the guys who know, they're in authority in this situation. But they only want to save their own butts. Many theologians are exactly the same. <laughs> Many doctrines just want to save their own butts. As for no more rapture, you become Jesus kills the whole family. He says, Father, I do not pray that you take them out of this world. <coughs> now that's enough scripture. But as you said, I said. So they were the sailors. Who else on the boat? The soldiers. What was in the soldiers' mind? Let's kill the prisoners. God spoke to prisoners, so Paul. How did Paul respond to it? Well, guys, I told you, you should have listened to me. I had more insight than the captain of this boat. So bye-bye sailors, bye-bye soldiers. And Philip's transport. Jonah, where are you? Well, follow me. He says, not one life will be set, will be lost in this boat. Because I have a mission in my life to go, to stand before the king. Darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness, where times get so desperate that all, all hope to be saved is lost. A valley of dead bones, dry bones, cannot get deader than that. <laughs> God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? O oh Lord, thou knowest. Did God say, oh, very, very good response, Ezekiel. Now stand back and let me do the miracle. He says, you prophesy to these bones. Darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness. Is it our job to measure the thickness of the darkness? No ways. We only have one job. Arise and shine. For your light has come. And the nation shall come to your light and their kings to the brightness of your rising. Because out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. How, we, how do we drink from you, Lord? He says, if you believe that I am what the scriptures are all about, you'll discover that you are what I am all about. You are my address. You are my temple. You are my living epistle. Paul says that earlier on in 2 Corinthians 3, but I've got to get to 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2. He says now, with the open statement of the truth. What is the open statement of the truth? The mirror message. Unveiled faces. We are beholding him. As in the mirror. And we are metamorpho, which is the opposite of amartia, translated sin. Amartia means without form. But it took our without form on the cross. The prophet saw him. He said he had no form that we should feel drawn to him. He took our hameros so that we can be metamorphic. Return to our original design. Our true form. Look to the rock from which you were human. The quarry 
from which you had dug. Paul says we commend ourselves to every man's conscience. Soon a door to see the same. There's only one thing to see. That's Paul's mission statement. Ephesians 3 verse 9. To make all men see. We have no other mission. But to make all men see. To no longer know any man after the flesh. But to only know man as he is revealed in Christ as in the mirror. We have no other reference, no other gospel to preach. I just want to conclude with this in Acts 17. Having made this powerful statement, quoting one of their philosophers, we are his offspring. So what's the matter then? Every doctrine in philosophy is based on distance. What inspires the distance? Just one thing, fear. And what sustains fear? Fear of punishment, guilt. What was cancelled on the cross then? The document of humanity's guilt. Remember the Lamb of God took away the sins of the world so that God could say, when the order of Melchizedek presented the blood of the Lamb before the living God, God said, of your sins and your iniquities and your unrighteousness, I will think no more. So Paul declares, he says, God has overlooked the times of ignorance. Ignorance will no longer be a valid excuse to ignore innocence. How did God do that, Paul? He has their attention. You go read it the rest of the last part of Acts 17. He says, God appointed a day and a person. You know that this whole book, the Old Testament, only has one theme. It's all about a day and a person. And the theme of that day and that person is one theme. The sufferings of Christ, the Messiah, and the subsequent glory. So that all flesh may see his glory. So Paul says, God appointed a day. And on that day, in that person, the world would be judged in righteousness. And here comes the good news. God has given proof. He has given testimony to this. To it. To the world's innocence. By raising Jesus from the dead. He was handed over. The Greek word says dia, because of our transgressions, Romans 4.25. Why was he raised? The same word, dia, because of our innocence. Oh, but Paul, that's a dangerous message. <laughs> Wouldn't that give people a license to sin? <laughs> what more license do they need? to redeem man's innocence. God's throne is established upon man's redeemed innocence. And read it, Hebrews 1 verse 3. Having made purification for sins, he sat down. The Lion of Judah, the only one worthy to break the seals of the mystery of the gospel. And when I looked, I saw Lamb, as if slain. There is only one language that reveals the power of God unto salvation. It's the language of salvation. What happened when his blood was shed? God sold all that he had and he bought the field. He brought an end, says Hebrews chapter 6, to all dispute. That's why Paul says avoid quarreling. Show perfect courtesy to all men. Because you might win the debate, but you might lose the person. And delay that person's salvation with another lap in the wilderness. Israel died in the wilderness because of one thing. 
Hebrews 4 calls it unbelief. What was their unbelief all about? They believed a lie about themselves. Image bearer of God. You are not a grasshopper. And the giants that you thought you saw are already defeated. He struck the enemy of his weaponry. What was his weapon? Your guilt. There is no more powerful message to proclaim in this world than the innocence of the human race. Nothing frees the drug addict more, the prostitute, the money swindler, the murderer. Nothing frees him more but to discover the truth about me. I don't have to waste another day in the old cage mentality because the voice of the free ego announces my true freedom. And just in case we get nervous about Paul saying we commend ourselves, he says three verses later, 2 Corinthians 5, 4 verse 5, he says we're not preaching ourselves, we are preaching Christ, but we can preach Him in no other way. We announce Him in us. Union with your maker. No hint of regret. The father dancing again with a prodigal. As if yesterday never was. Because Jesus is the same yesterday. And today. And forever. We have forgotten says Deuteronomy 32 verse 18 we have forgotten the rock that begot us and the father the Hebrew says who danced with us Jesus is his music so that we may dance with him again there is a union a oneness that he invites us to what a change Jesus is. He is the great invitation to the human race. You have been with me all along, and all that I have is yours. What a gentleman. In the three parables, the first two tells us how the shepherd seeks the lost lamb. And how the widow lights, or the lady lights the lamp in the house to seek the lost coin. Someone once said, but it seemed that the father was just waiting. Why didn't he go out to seek? Tell me, where was Jesus? when he told the story. He was in a distant land. He came to his own. He could not get close. He says, you've seen me. You've seen the Father. He says, I did not come to condemn this world. Don't understand my Father wrong. The Father judges no one. All judgment was given to the Son. And you know what he did? He took it. Surely, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised with our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace. When we plucked out his beard and spat in his face, he took our judgment and now announces our innocence. The resurrection is the receipt of humanity's equipment. There is no other gospel to preach. We salute you, Father. We bow before you. We honor your gospel.
We bow before gentlemen, Jesus. The one who allows the Father to continue to plead through us. Be you reconciled. Because you already are. See you.